Before I start my talk, I would like to show you a video and take you back in time to 1993, when we first discovered the internet. Oh, that's that right. little mark with the A and then the ring around it? At? See, that's what I said. Mm -hmm. um, Katie said she thought it was about. Yeah. Oh. But I'd never heard it. Around I'd never heard it said. I'd, I'd always seen around. the mark, but never yeah. heard it said. And then yeah. it sounded stupid when I said it. Violence at NBC. <coughs> yeah, well, I heard around being or about. in the lunchroom the other See? week. <laughs> there it is. Violence at NBC, GE com. I mean, well, what well, Allison should know. What, what do you is say internet about anyway? Internet is uh, that massive computer right. network, mm -hmm. the one that's becoming really big now. What do you mean? That's big. How does one? What do you write to it like mail? No, a lot of people use it and communicate. It, I guess they can communicate with NBC writers and producers. Allison, can you explain what internet is? No. What, is, what does it mean? It's a, it's a giant computer network made up made up of uh, started from. Oh, I thought you were going to tell us what this was. It's so like a, look a in the computer dictionary. billboard. It's not, it's, it's not in it. It's it, it's it's a computer billboard, but it's nationwide, right. and it's, it's several uh, universities and everything all joined together. And right. And others can access it. And, right. And it's getting bigger and bigger all the time. It just came great. in really handy during the quake. A lot of people, that's how they were communicating out to tell family and loved ones they were okay because all the phone lines were down. I was telling Katie and I was But you don't, need, you, don't need that, you don't need a phone line to operate no. internet? No. So I guess it reminds us of something. It's very similar to the discussions we're having today about blockchain. So what is blockchain anyway? There's certainly a lot of hype around that technology. Why? Because there is this narrative around blockchain that it might lead us to utopia that it might resolve a lot of problems that we have today. How? By bringing us this next generation internet, which many people refer to as the Web3. And this next generation internet will hopefully resolve a lot of problems that we have currently in the current internet. By, on one hand, changing our data structures and bringing much more control over our private data. On the other hand, by providing a governance layer um, for the internet, that we're currently lacking, enabling us to have true peer-to-peer -peer transactions without middlemen. And the third part is it could revolutionize money and value creation. Now let's look at all these three different promises. So on one hand, data structures. We're moving away from a world of, I would like to call it data monarchy, to a world of data democracy. The internet that we have today is currently built on the logic of standalone computers where data is stored centrally and it's processed through centralized servers. Why? Because we first had the computer and then the internet. And what the internet did, it provided for a communication protocol, the IP protocol, that allowed two computers to communicate with each other. And when they did, they would send data packages from one computer to the other. And every time that happens, a copy of that data gets created and sent to the other computer. And every time that happens, every time we use internet-based services, we lose control and ownership of our data. That's not only a privacy issue, obviously. It's also a huge issue in the back end of e-commerce operations along the supply chain and of goods and services, because the document handling and data management along these backend processes is tedious, it's costly, and it's inefficient. Because when we send data over the internet, we lose control of what happens because we cannot see what happens behind the walled garden of the server that somebody else owns. Now, blockchain introduces a completely novel way of si uh, saving and processing data, building on the idea of peer-to-peer -peer technologies. Peer-to-peer -peer technologies are not a new thing, but blockchain is taking it to a new level. All computers in the network have the same level of information. All information, all data is transparent to every computer in the network. Privacy is guaranteed through the use of cryptography. So we have transparency while maintaining the privacy of all actors. And the real game changer of blockchain here was that it introduced economic incentives to make sure that all computers in the network perform and behave correctly. The blockchain protocol assumes that everyone is potentially corrupt. And in order to provide for network security, it incentivizes the network actor with a network token. And we will look at that in the next slide. 
So we're moving away from de centralized data structures to decentralized and distributed data structures. On a second level, blockchain provides for a governance tool, a novel way of organizing society. It allows us to move away from the current way we organize society, but we also process data and manage data in the internet. From what you see on the left, a pyramid to a network. So first look at how society is organized today. It's mostly in a form of top-down organizations where you have one legal entity which is registered somewhere so you know who to sue in case something goes wrong. And the relationship of the people working for that organization is managed by contracts. It assumes that we don't fully trust each other, and while we negotiate our agreements verbally, we write them down, we sign them in the form of contracts, so if anyone, any party to an agreement doesn't stick to their end of the bargain, we can take this piece of paper, go in front of court, and sue someone. The relationship of these organizations with other organizations is all also managed by legal contracts, and the relationship of nation states with other nation states is also managed by legal contracts. Whether it's our companies, or our schools, our universities, or our bureaucratic institutions. Now, the Bitcoin blockchain introduced a completely novel way of managing society through the blockchain protocol. And you can see that if you look on the right side of the slide behind me. The Bitcoin blockchain is a decentralized autonomous organization of stakeholders who do not know or trust each other, who for the most part live in different countries, speak different languages, and are subject to different regulation. There is no centralized entity regulating the Bitcoin blockchain. And Everyone participating in the network, and by now it's hundreds and thousands and millions of people, all these people don't have any type of legal agreement or working contract with each other. Yet they all run in the same direction. How? Because all the rules of who is allowed to do when and what are defined in the protocol. That protocol is open source. It also defines how network actors are incentivized and disincentivized. How do we make sure that network actors who do not know and trust each other all behave according to predefined rules? We incentivize them with a network token. And in the Bitcoin blockchain, this is Bitcoin. Every time a network actor validates transactions according to predefined rules, they perform a service to the network, they keep the network safe, they keep the network correct, and they get rewarded with the network token, which is Bitcoin. So as you can see, this is a completely new way of governing society without any centralized institution. Anyone who wants to participate in the network without the permission of a centralized entity can download the code and be part of the network. At the heart of this protocol is the so-called smart contract. Now, the smart contract, unfortunately, isn't very smart, and lawyers would agree that it's not a legal contract. What it is, is what you can see in this picture. It's a digital handshake. It's a piece of code that defines a rule set of who is allowed to do when and what. And this piece of code runs on a distributed network, on a peer-to-peer -peer network, and is automatically enforced when the majority of network actors agree that the predefined conditions have been met. This means that we are radically cutting the transaction costs of monitoring, auditing, and enforcing agreements, something that we cannot do in the world today. Because in the world today, we have contracts that, while they might be written on a computer, they're still printed in paper for the most part, and they're still being signed by hand for the most part. Now, a smart contract looks like this. It's a piece of code where all the rules of interaction or transaction or agreement are put in code, which is automatically enforced, and the way you sign a smart contract is by private key. Now, the private key obviously doesn't look like this. It looks like this. It's a strong cryptographic password that identifies you as you, and you can use it as a digital signature on the blockchain. The third game changer of blockchain seem to be tokens or cryptocurrencies. What blockchain has allowed us to do through the back door of smart contracts 
is within a few lines of code, create a token that can represent anything from a physical good to a digital good to an access right, a mix thereof, or it could even steer a decentralized network of actors if I have good game theoretical design behind it. If you know what you're doing today, you can create a smart contract within a few minutes with a few lines of code. But what you write into that smart contract, what, the, what is the purpose of the token? What um, are the governance properties of that token, et cetera, et cetera? These are not technological questions. They're governance questions. And just as the World Wide Web, which was invented here at CERN, revolutionized the way that websites were displayed and created within just a few lines of code. Smart contracts allow us to create cryptographic token that can represent any asset or any access right within a few lines of code. And just as it was really hard for us in the beginning of the 90s to figure out what to do with websites, could we ever make money with it? Like, we were playing around. We are trying to figure out what this thing is. It took us 10 years until we did. And when we did, the Web 2 came. And it will probably take us another few years to figure out what we can really do, meaningfully do, with this new or in this new token economy. And a very good example of what we can do is, for example, Steemit. Steemit is a decentralized social network that runs on a blockchain. It is a combination of Facebook and Reddit. Anyone can contribute any type of post to Steemit, and anyone can upvote or downvote this post. And every time you do, you can earn a network token for your contribution to the network, either by providing content or by curating content. The data is transparent on the blockchain, so everyone has full control over what happens with their data. And you can earn money for contributions. If you want to find out what blockchain is, how the token economy works, the best thing is to go on Steemit. It has been operational for almost three years now. It has one million registered users, and I personally know people who make money. That is the utopian part of what we can do with blockchain. But technology is just a tool, and technology is neither inherently good nor inherently bad. How we use that tool is up to us. And we should be very careful how we use this very powerful tool of blockchain technology and auto-enforceable code. Because if we don't design these blockchains properly, we might design a machine that acts against us. And I would like to point out two aspects. One is governance. Who decides what the governance rules of these blockchains and smart contracts are? Who decides what rules we write into that code? Because this code itself it sets the technological limitation. The technology sets the limitations of what is possible and what we cannot do. It sets the boundaries of what we can do. And while many engineers are working on this cutting-edge technology, and they're super smart. They're not governance experts. So we need engineers to work with governance experts to decide how we want to write this code. Because what this code should automatically enforce, it's not a technological question only. It's a governance question. It's an ethical question. It's an economic question. It's an organizational question, et cetera, et cetera. And what we're seeing right now is that a bunch of very, very talented but still, a bunch of engineers are predominantly creating these operating systems of our potential future societies. And we have to make sure that we don't run into the same problems we ran uh, in the Web 2, creating protocol bias, just as we created algorithmic bias in the Web 2. And one example is the incentive mechanisms behind blockchains, like, for example, the Bitcoin blockchain, they're currently plutocratic. If you have more money in the real world, you can buy more computers, you have more processing power, and you have more vote in the system, and you can make more money. So the current blockchains, the current incentive is me mechanisms, they're like capitalism on steroids. Do we want this kind of system? Because if we don't, we have to come up with alternative consent mechanisms to the mechanisms that Bitcoin and derived blockchains use. The good news here, 
There are a lot of researchers already trying to figure out alternative mechanisms to the current mechanisms that are not based on plutocracy. But the question of which one will really be successful has not been resolved yet. And the second part is cryptography. These systems are designed to be transparent, and we need them to be transparent so we have full control of data trails, of our private data trails, but also of the provenance of goods and services. But we also need to maintain our privacy, and we can do that with strong cryptographic tools that we have. Unfortunately, state-of-the-art blockchains like Bitcoin are not really fully anonymous. And if we're not careful, we could create through the back door of that technology a control machine, like, for example, the citizen scorecard that China is currently creating. Because blockchain is an incentive machine. You can incentivize people to do the right thing, to save CO2 emission reduction, or you can use the same technology to control your people. This is why we need to talk of, about privacy, privacy by design, and how we can provide for it with the right cryptographic tool. We do have the right technology for it, and newer blockchains are using these alternative cryptographic tools. But unfortunately, through the back door of legislation, many countries are currently passing anti-terror legislation, anti-criminal legislation that is kind of condemning um, cryptographic methods, which could be a potential indicator for potential criminal activity. So do we want to ban cryptography, or do we consider cryptography as a digital human right that we need in the digital age, just as we have introduced the right to the privacy of communication and the secrecy of the letter or the sanctity of the home in our constitutional foundations of our democratic constitutions? To cut the long story short, whether we create a freedom machine or a control machine has not been decided yet. As you saw in this video, we're in the very, very, very early stages, similar to the 90s for the internet. We're at the very, very early stages of this new and novel technology. So now is the time to contribute. Now is the time to take action. Now is the time to learn what this technology is and how you can contribute to that open source technology. So the future is in our hands. Let's make something out of it. Thank you.